Then there are the renewables. Wind power has a high EROEI, but is intermittent. Hydropower is reliable, but most rivers in the developed world are already dammed. Conventional geothermal power plants use existing hotspots near the Earth's surface. They are limited to those areas. In the experimental EGS system, two shafts would be drilled six miles deep. Water is pumped down one shaft to be heated in fissures, then rise up the other, generating power. According to a recent MIT report, this technology might supply 10% of US electricity by 2050. Wave power is restricted to coastal areas. The energy density of waves varies from region to region. Transporting wave-generated electricity inland would be challenging. Also, the salty ocean environment is corrosive to turbines. Biofuels are fuels that are grown. Wood has a low energy density and grows slowly. The world uses 3.7 cubic miles of wood a year. Biodiesel and ethanol are made from crops grown by petroleum-powered agriculture. The energy profit from these fuels is very low. Some politicians want to turn corn into ethanol. Using ethanol to supply one-tenth of projected US oil use in 2020 would require 3% of America's land. To supply one-third would require three times the area now used to grow food. To supply all US petroleum consumption in 2020 would take twice as much land as is used to grow food. Hydrogen has to be extracted from natural gas, coal or water, which uses more energy than is generated from the hydrogen. This makes a hydrogen economy unlikely. All the world's photovoltaic solar panels generate as much electricity as two coal power plants. The equivalent of between one and four tons of coal are used in the manufacture of a single solar panel. We'd have to cover as many as 140,000 square miles with panels to meet current world demand. As of 2007, there were only about four square miles. Concentrated solar power, or solar thermal, has great potential, though at the moment there are only a small number of plants operating. They are also limited to sunny climates, requiring large amounts of electricity to be transmitted over long distances. All of the alternatives to oil depend on oil-powered machinery or require materials such as plastics that are produced from oil. When considering future claims of amazing new fuels or inventions, ask, does the advocate have a working commercial model of the invention? What is its energy density? Can it be stored or easily distributed? Is it reliable or intermittent? Can it be scaled to a national level? Are there hidden engineering challenges? What is the E or OEI? What are the environmental impacts? Remember that large numbers can be deceptive. For example, one billion barrels of oil will satisfy global demand for only 12 days. A transition from fossil fuels would be a monumental challenge. As of 2007, coal generates 48.5% of US electricity. 21.6% is from natural gas. 1.6% is from petroleum. 19.4% is from nuclear. 5.8% is from hydro. Other renewables only generate 2.5%. Is it possible to replace a system based on fossil fuels with a patchwork of alternatives? Major technological advances are needed, as well as political will and cooperation, massive investment, international consensus, the retrofitting of the $45 trillion global economy, including transportation, manufacturing industries and agricultural systems, as well as officials competent to manage the transition. If all these are achieved, could the current way of life continue? These bacteria live in a bottle. Their population doubles every minute. At 11 a.m. there is one bacterium. At 12 noon the bottle is full. It is half full at 11.59, leaving only enough space for one more doubling. 
The bacteria see the danger. They search for new bottles and find three. They assume that their problem is solved. By 12 noon, the first bottle is full. By 12.01, the second bottle is full. By 12.02, all the bottles are full. This is the problem that we face due to the doubling caused by exponential growth. When humanity began to use coal and oil as fuel sources, it experienced unprecedented growth. Even low growth rates produced large increases over time. At a 1% growth rate, an economy will double in 70 years. A 2% rate doubles in 35 years. At a 10% growth rate, an economy will double in only 7 years. If an economy grows at the current average of 3%, it doubles every 23 years. With each doubling, demand for energy and resources will exceed all the previous doublings combined. The financial system is built on the assumption of growth, which requires an increasing supply of energy to support it. Banks lend money they don't have, in effect creating it. The borrowers use the newly created loan money to grow their businesses and pay back the debt with an interest payment which requires more growth. Due to this creation of debt formed money, most of the world's money represents a debt with interest to be paid. Without continual, new and ever larger generations of borrowers to produce growth and thus pay off these debts, the world economy will collapse. Like a Ponzi scheme, the system must expand or die. Partly through this debt system, the effects of economic growth have been spectacular in GDP, damming of rivers, water use, fertilizer consumption, urban population, paper consumption, motor vehicles, communications and tourism. World population has grown to 7 billion and is expected to exceed 9 billion by 2050. On a flat, infinite Earth, this might not be a problem. However, as the Earth is round and finite, we will eventually face limits to growth. Economic expansion has resulted in increases in atmospheric nitrous oxide and methane, ozone depletion, increases in great floods, damage to ocean ecosystems, including nitrogen runoff, loss of rainforest and woodland, increases in domesticated land, and species extinctions. If we place a single grain of rice on the first square of a chessboard, double this and place two grains on the second, double again and place four on the third, double again and place eight on the fourth and continue this way, putting on each square twice the number of grains than were on the previous one. By the time we reach the final square, we need an astronomical number of grains. Nine quintillion, 223 quadrillion, 372 trillion, 36 billion, 854 million, 776 thousand grains. More grain than the human race has grown in the last 10,000 years. Modern economies, like the grains on the chessboard, double every few decades. On which square of the chessboard are we? Besides energy, civilization demands numerous essential resources. Fresh water, topsoil, food, forests and many kinds of minerals and metals. Growth is limited by the essential resource in scarcest supply. A barrel is made of staves. And like water filling a barrel, growth can go no further than the lowest stave, or the most limited essential resource. Humans currently utilize 40% of all photosynthesis on Earth. Though it might be possible to use 80%, we are unlikely to ever use 160%. The global food supply relies heavily on fossil fuels. Before World War I, all agriculture was organic. 
Following the invention of fossil fuel derived fertilizers and pesticides, there were massive improvements in food production, allowing for increases in human population. The use of artificial fertilizers has fed far more people than would have been possible with organic agriculture alone. Fossil fuels are needed for farming equipment, transportation, refrigeration, packaging in plastic and cooking. Modern agriculture uses land to turn fossil fuels into food and food into people. About seven calories of fossil fuel energy are used to produce one calorie of food. In America, food travels approximately 1,500 miles from farm to customer. Besides fossil fuel decline, there are several threats to the current system of food production. Cheap energy, improved technology, and subsidies have allowed massive fish catches. Global fish catches peaked in the late 1980s, forcing fishermen to move into deep waters. Nitrogen runoff by fossil fuel based fertilizers poisons rivers and seas, creating enormous dead zones. At this rate, all fish populations are projected to collapse by 2048. Acid rain from cities and industries leaches the soil of vital nutrients such as potassium, calcium and magnesium. Another threat is a lack of water. Many farms use water pumped from underground aquifers for irrigation. The aquifers need thousands of years to fill up but can be pumped dry in a few decades, like oil wells. America's massive Ogallala aquifer has fallen so low that many farmers have had to return to less productive dry land farming. Additionally, the use of irrigation and fertilizers can lead to salinization, the accumulation of salt in the soil. This is a major cause of desertification. Still another threat is topsoil loss. 200 years ago, there were six feet of topsoil on the American prairies. Today, through tillage and poor practices, approximately half is gone. Irrigation encourages the growth of stem rust fungi like UG99, which has the potential to destroy 80% of the world's grain harvest. According to Norman Borlaug, father of the Green Revolution, stem rust has immense potential for social and human destruction. The use of biofuels means that less land will be available for food production, 